Division II NAIA girls. But that shows that you got to have coaching, and he'll have to he'll coach that. But right now, he can't do it, and obviously, in a drill, it makes a drill look better. Number two, anytime your post player makes a move and scores, they never take the ball out of the net. Because they can only do that twice in a game and it's a technical. Who's the one player in your team they want to beat down the floor every time? Your post player. So every time your post player scores, they take three steps out to the free throw line. They don't grab a basket. They don't do it. So we always want somebody there to grab the ball so they can get out and run to the free throw line. Then they can get back in line. This is something we tried. Time sprints, but here are the sprints. You get out of bounds in the baseline, facing the wall, heels on the baseline, and you got 1.8 seconds to get to the free throw line. 1.8 seconds to get to the free throw line. Then, after you've done that a couple times, then you do, you've got three seconds to get to the half line. Then, you got 3.5 to get to that free throw line. Now those, I don't know whose times they are, but our guys made all those times, so we told them those are NBA times. That's the time it takes guys in the NBA to get to those spots. Now, I don't even know where you run the thing from. They're probably in a three-point stance instead of facing away. But, you know, if you're on the offensive board, you're probably going to have to run that way to defense. So I like that, you know, and then you, what you put in your mind. You know, you guys are able to beat NBA times. You know, there's no reason people should be beating us down the floor. The technique on two-on-one. I want the ball in my inside hand, dribbling it. Because the angles, this angle and this angle are a lot different, aren't they? This angle, I've got a lot more chance of getting the ball by the defender. And I want to throw it like this if I can. The receiver two-on-one wants to be one step behind me one yard behind me, because then they can speed up or they can cut their speed. And that creates a better passing angle too, when they drag by a step. Now, if I can go all the way, I just cross over and take it up. If I'm on this side, it's this way, this way, or take it up this way. A Paxson layup, a you know, reverse right-handed layup, reverse left hand. You can shoot a right hand on the other side if you have to. You know, as far as using your weak hand, John Wooden always said, you don't use your weak hand until you have to. You know, all the time people spend on left-handed hook shots with post players, it's probably a big waste. The Russians, there's a book that's never been published. I got a manuscript of it by Gamelsky, the only American, the only Russian in the American Hall of Fame. They take 1,000 go-to jump hooks a day, those centers. They said, well, what about your counter move? They said, when you take 1,000 go-to jump hooks a day, you don't need a counter move. Now, there's something to be said for that. Roger Clemens, how do you pitch? I take this ball and throw it by you until you show me you can do something with it. Then I get cute. Don't jack, you know, it's good to teach weak hand dribble and stuff like that. That's very good to work on those skills. But you go to your strengths until people take it away. Now, someday people will take it away, and you've got to have something new, something a little different. Offensive board coverage. If a, if a player with the ball penetrates the arc and shoots it, they're a rebounder. I don't care what size they are. Now, the thing he did where, where Vance had the guy shoot that jumper and four pillars rebounded, if Scottie Pippen is playing for the Bulls, he's going to run by that shooter. And if they get the rebound, it's going to be a dunk. That, Pippen got more dunks running by people. 
you, it's very hard for the shooter to be the safety, or we call them the fullback. We have fullbacks, halfbacks, and then tailbacks. Tailbacks rebound and get their tails back. Halfbacks are, you know, halfway between a halfback and a fullback. So if you have a shooter getting back, that's tough. Now your defensive transition is going to be determined by how you cover the boards. It's different all the time. We've had years where we've had our point guard rebound. Two different teams where we had different point guards that rebounded offensively. This year, we'll say one and two never go to the offensive boards. Three, four, and five always go to the offensive boards just because of the way our personnel works out. That we're, just, we're not gonna give up any fast breaks, but three, four, and five are gonna go. If three shooting, he's going. Two shooting, he's going. Three's going. Three's always going because our threes could be good offensive rebounders. Our twos, not really. You know, our ones, never. So we like our one up here to play the ball and we like our two back to play the basket. That's the way we'd like it to be. The team super, you could play three back. The pros, they play five back. The Spurs never get an offensive rebound unless it's a mistake because they never have anybody offensive rebounding. All five of them are back and they just aren't gonna give up any fast breaks. I think the best fast break conditioner I've seen is John Wooden's. Two on one fast break conditioner has a team of blues over here, team of yellow over there. Two blues have it there. Two, uh, one yellow runs out, touches the center circle, goes back. When these two cross, one more comes out. So you've got somebody wolfing it, chasing it from behind. Then the defense gets it, they come. When they, when they get the ball, one comes out, goes back. When they cross, one more comes and it's two on two. And you can play that for like five minutes, make them competitive. It's fairly game-like. Then three on two, three have it. Two come out and go back, three cross, extra one comes, three on three. It's a pretty simple concept. You get to compete. I, I sort of like that. I, I think it, you get that game feeling. And if you see that they're leaving too soon, you just have a coach there, or you penalize them, you do whatever you want to do. But you can, you can make it tougher for them by making them go out later just to have a coach direct traffic. Points of contact. Where'd you go to high school? Forest Lake. Forest Lake what? Minnesota. Minnesota. Who was all in your league? Huh? Um, like the teams? Yeah, that's... Okay, like White Bear. And White Bear, okay. And, and you worked with uh, Dave DeWitt then? And he worked with your AAU team? Yeah. And I told you about Claire last night, didn't I? His daughter. She's... she's uh, Arrested developmentally, really a great kid, Claire. That's one of their kids. They got a lot of kids. See, points of contact. People aren't interested. People aren't attracted to you by what they see in you, but what you see in them. So you try to make points of contact. So the next time you're in touch with them, you can say, "Hey, you played for Dave Dewitt AAU, didn't you? Or how's your dog Bowser doing?" Or How's that new shotgun or what kind of golf game you got going right now? Or you want to have one little thing that you can zing them with right away because then all the defenses are down and they're just jacking around with a friend. Now let's define friend. Let's define it. A friend is somebody you don't have to measure your thoughts or weigh your words when you're with. You don't have to measure your thoughts or weigh your words. Like, being calculating, you know, recruiting, you're calculating everything when you're recruiting. You can't just be yourself like Tubby Smith. You've got to calculate everything. That's not, that's not the way to be. So points of contact really helps you 
learn something about somebody, which is really more important than them learning about you. Who the heck cares? You know, nothing worse than the sound of somebody blowing their own horn. Okay, now how about this? Who's helping you when you aren't there? Who's helping you if you're recruiting a kid and you're not there? Who's helping you in the cafe downtown when they're ripping your butt? Who's going to stand up and say no? That person can coach or they're a good person. They've helped our community. Who's helping you when you aren't there? That's a heck of a concept. And that engenders public relations, but if it's public relations, it's really not real, you know what I mean? It's public relations. But I mean, it's just having good things said about you because you're a good person. McDonald's had one franchise in Des Plaines, Illinois. They used Pepsi. On a Saturday, they ran out of Pepsi, so they called the Pepsi plant. They said, could you please bring us Pepsi? We're out. Whoever answered the phone says, we don't bring nobody, nobody, no Pepsi on Saturdays, and hung up. That next Monday, Monday the only McDonald's in the world signed an exclusive contract with Coca-Cola. If Coca-Cola lost every contract they have and kept McDonald's, they would do well. Because one jackass answered the phone, rudely and inefficiently. Salesmanship. A corporation may spread itself over the entire world and may employ 100,000 people, but the average person will form their judgment of it through their contact with one individual. If this individual is rude or inefficient, it will take a lot of kindness and efficiency to overcome that bad impression. Every member of an organization who in any capacity comes in contact with the public is a salesman and the impression they make is an advertisement, good or bad. That card's over there. You kids ought to be grabbing those, putting them in a you know, file folder for your classes. The teacher might think you knew something. We have our guys put this by their driver's license and they ask for a proof of perfect purchase, a proof of age, thanks. Stop and think, is this a risk I can afford to take? How will this affect my future? How will this affect my family? How will this affect my teammates and coaches? You get a DUI in college, you're gonna have a hard time teaching. We ask them to put this by their driver's license and we're scared to death every weekend. This card on teaching by Sapphire making one or two simple points and asking questions, questions, and more questions. There's some really good stuff over there. Get it all. The stop and think cards, if nobody picks them up and you're the last person, get them all for your kids in school. You might save a life. <clears throat> There's an old coach, well, one great thing about what Vance does is that I think the hardest thing to guard is a guard with the ball going like a bat out of hell. Like a bull in a china closet. They're hard to guard. Just go like a bat out of hell and you're hard to guard. Now you've got to be able to do something when you get down there, but that's hard to guard. So what do you want your point guards to do? Is You want to push the ball up the floor every time. If they don't push the ball up the floor, they got to come out. Now, if you only have one point guard, then you got to play differently. You can't be so stupid as to try to do what somebody else is doing and you're not solid. You still got to be solid. Now, you got to evaluate how many times you're going to get to do that in the game. How many times you're going to have to have an offensive half-court possession and score or a defensive half-court possession and stop you? All that pressing crap doesn't do any good if you can't score. You've got to score to press. I don't care if you can say you can press off and miss shots. I mean, if you're that dang good, we're just not even going to play you. You know what I mean? We're not going to come over. We're not going to play you if you're that good, that you can press us on our misses on your missing. We're just, they're not scheduling you. I'll coach AAU or something like that, where I can win every game. 
Nobody cares if you win or lose anyway. It's just what big tournament did you go to? Jeez. You ask a player how they like to play and they'll say, like the fast break and run motion offense. If you ask players, players don't like to learn to run plays. They just want to play. Are you, what do you guys think? You like to learn how to play instead of run plays? But there's coaches that it's like a football practice. How in the heck can you work on fundamentals when you've got 150 plays? You better have better players than everybody else. You know, Pete Gaudet said a great thing in the clinic. A great thing. Would you rather have two new plays in March or two better players? So you've got to work on learning how to play. You've got to work on skills. You've got to learn how to play together. That's the fun in running motion offense is you, you learn to play the game together and the whole becomes greater than the sum of the parts. And teams that shouldn't win, that army of asses led by a lion beat the team of lions led by an ass. The winningest coach in the United States in college basketball has 1,084 wins. His name is Gene Best. He coaches at Three Rivers Community College. He had won national championships. He's a Baptist deacon. He raises rabbits. He runs three miles a day. He hunts turkeys. He's pretty old. And he said, I've only learned one thing in coaching basketball in all my years. Your teams have to play very, very, very hard. So if you could just get your kids to play hard, Boy, that's something. And then if you could get them to play smart, boy, that would be something. And if you can get them to play together, then that's the ultimate. Now, I'm telling you, I think sometimes getting them to play together comes before getting them to play smart. Because human beings are pretty dumb. I read the Old Testament in my Lucado Study Bible. It's got, old, it's got a thing from him, then an Old Testament, then Proverbs, or Psalms, Proverbs, and then some New Testament. But it's amazing how stupid those people were in the Old Testament times. They were the dumbest jackasses in the history of... Unbelievable how dumb they were. They never did anything right. We haven't changed. We have not changed at all. So, getting them to play smart... But Gene Best is a pretty good coach. 1,084 wins, that's a few. Especially Juco. You're taking a few rides. And he is a disciplinarian. And they, they play hard. I'd hope that there'd be some young coaches here that would be like Paul Bryant, who when he was an assistant coach at Vanderbilt, they said this about him. They knew he was going to be great long before they called him Bear. There's some people you know that want to be coaches or that are coaching that are young. You can say, they're going to be great. They've got it. You know what I mean? Long before they're called Bear. Now, there's some older people here that look like Bears. I don't know, have any hope for you guys. I don't know. But if you're an old coach, you try to stay young. And coaching keeps you young, really keeps you young. Now for the old coaches, you don't want to quit. You don't want to retire because every coach I ever talked to that retired always said I should have never quit. I had a couple more good years. I got mad at some principal or some superintendent and they got under my skin and I just quit. I shouldn't have done that. The saddest day of your life is going to be when you're no longer productive. So if you do retire and get out, you've got to have something to do to be productive. You've got to have something. I don't play golf because I coach. 
I said, you know, if I had last game, I might just walk out, get in a plane, fly somewhere warm, go to golf school for about three months, get perfect clubs, come home, get up at eight, practice for an hour, play four hours of golf, practice for another hour, and the day's gone. I can go home and watch Cavuto and fall asleep in my chair. But maybe there's better things to do than that. Ecclesiastes 5, 19 and 20. When God gives a man wealth and possessions and enables him to enjoy them, to accept his lot and be happy in his work, this is a gift of God. This man seldom thinks back on the days of his life because he is occupied with gladness of heart. There's a lot there. Enjoy what you have. Enjoy your work. Accept your lot in life. Don't think back on the past because you're occupied with gladness of heart. You don't reminisce. I keep all my letters and throw them in a box. I don't know why, because I'm never going to read them. You know? I got to file Espy's letters. I got to file just regular letters. I just throw them in there and take them home after a while and bring the file back, fill it up again. I like to keep pictures of players and stuff so somebody I can come back and say, who was that guy? I don't remember coaching that guy, you know. Maybe drool on it a little bit. Now there's four kinds of coaches. I want to tell you a story first about a guy who got fired. And he came home and he told his wife, I just got fired. And she says, that's great. He says, what do you mean that's great? So it's wonderful. What do you mean? He says, you shouldn't be a contractor. You are meant to be a novelist. You are a great writer. He says, well, what am I going to do? He says, you're going to take a year and you're going to write a novel. And it'll be a bestseller. He says, look, we don't have any money. How are we going to do it? She goes back in the bedroom, pulls up the, open the top drawer in her dresser, brings a box, and it's just full of money. She says, I've been sewing and selling stuff. We got enough money here to live for a year. You don't have to work. You write that novel. The guy took all year to write the novel. And then he published it and sold it. The Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Hawthorne. He also wrote The Man on the Mountain or The Great Stone Face. He wrote a lot of stuff. All because he had a wife who had faith in him. And he got in the right, he did the thing he was meant to do. Now, Jerry Krause is a coach that's with Gonzaga. I played for Jerry, he was an assistant. And we've done a lot of stuff together. When he's seven days old, his mom died. When he's 10 years old, he went in the barn and saw his dad hanging, hung himself. They sent him to live with an uncle and an aunt who were alcoholics and abused him. And he had to make some choices in his life and what kind of attitude he was going to have. And I know exactly where I was when he told me this, and I've never lost it. I'll never forget it. He said, there's three things you have to do in life. Number one, you have to find your unique talent or gift. Number two, you have to develop to the fullest your unique talent or gift. You have to polish it, you have to hone it, you have to perfect it, whatever that gift might be. And then number three, you got to give that gift away every day. Jerry Krause's three rules for Indian Wells, San Antonio, and all those other talks. So, it's Christmas and you get all these gifts and people say, hey, how'd they like your gifts? You say, oh, I don't give them out. I put them in a the closet because I get a buzz out of not giving gifts to people. No, you get a buzz out of giving your gift away, whatever your gift is. Find your gift. Maybe you're just an especially kind-hearted person. Maybe you're really smart with books or organization or maybe you're a good salesman, stuff like that. But find your gift and then give it away. Now I want to talk about the four kinds of coaches there are. In the five stages of your career, 
And then I'm going to show you an example of something that's really good on balance. And then I'm going to tell you the greatest joke that's ever been told. I haven't told you the toast joke yet, though, have I? I'll tell you the toast joke. Have you heard the cheap vasectomy joke? You've heard that one, haven't you? Huh? If you haven't, just the guys are not nodding their heads, just ask them to tell it, okay? Well, the four kinds of coaches. The first kind of coach is unconscious and an incompetent. Unconscious and incompetent. This coach doesn't know they don't know. You know what I mean? They're the kind of guys that walk around with a rolled up program because they saw John Wooden do that. Or they all want to coach D1 and they're just out of college, you know? They're going to be a D1 coach. Second kind of coach is conscious and incompetent. That means they know they don't know. And in Proverbs, it talks about that being the beginning of wisdom, to know you don't know. It's a good thing to read a chapter of Proverbs a day corresponding to the date. That's a good thing to do because you read it 12 times in a year. And you get a lot smarter because that guy's pretty smart. And even though he was smart, he couldn't handle success. For every 100 who can handle failure, Solomon screwed up big time. He couldn't handle success. And he was the wisest guy in the world. They're conscious that they're incompetent. Third one is conscious and competent. They know, but there's no flow. There's no spontaneity. It's checklist after checklist. They're an anal coach. An anal coach will always have good teams. An anal coach will have good teams when they have poor players, and they'll have good teams when they have great players. And you know why. They'll have good teams with poor players, got their thumb on them. They'll have good teams with great players, because they got their thumb on them. They won't let the horses run. So that's a real, it's sometimes harder to coach good players than it is to coach bad players. And then the fourth coach is the unconscious and competent coach. And with this coach, there is flow. It's spontaneous. That would be like Michael Jordan, Tiger Woods, or the little old lady at church who when she hears that someone has cancer, immediately starts writing down people who could prepare meals. She's writing down people who could start a prayer chain. She's writing down a doctor she heard of that dealt with somebody who had this same kind of cancer. And she's doing all that because that's where her mama brought her up to be, like Bear Bryant's mama brought him up to be, to do the right thing because it don't take nothing to be nice. Tiger Woods, after every workout, makes 109-foot putts in a row. That means he starts over on 99 if he misses. I don't, I, I've had guys tell me that have worked these tournaments that there's nobody that can concentrate like he does when he practices. And everybody's hanging around him too while he's doing it. But he completely shuts them out. His tournament before he blew his knee, he had 51 putts from 12 feet or in, and he made 50. He said, if people knew how hard I worked, they wouldn't think what I did was so easy. To be really something special, to be great, it takes a lot of hard work. The five stages of your career. This is from Jeff Jansen's book. The first stage is survival. That's where you don't know, come here from Sikkim, you don't have a philosophy. You're just trying to find somebody you can copy. You don't know spit. The phone rings, you're peeing blood because it's a parent and you don't want to confront them. My first three years of coaching, I was so dang scared when that phone rang. I didn't know what was going on. Second coach, the second stage is the, the satisfaction stage. That's where you want to win some games. You want to win a championship. You want respect. When you walk in the gym, you want people to say, I want to watch this person coach. I want to watch them work with their players. I want to learn how they 
motivate, lead, and drive players to a higher level. I want to watch him play. I want to learn everything about this coach. Then you reach the third stage, the satisfaction stage. You win some championships. And you just sort of put it on cruise control and you coast. You think you can throw your glove out there and win. You don't do the little things you did to be great. You take shortcuts. Fourth stage is a significant stage. That's where, when they mention your school, immediately they think of you. Like this guy that, that guy that wore the Wisconsin shirt one day and wears a Butler shirt today. You say his school's name and immediately you think of that guy. Now that's a very dangerous position to be in because people get jealous. Now I'll do a little test. Tell me what comes to your mind. You stay LA. Penn State, Indiana, Alabama. Some of those guys have been dead. Some of them should be dead, like Paterno. Um, him and Bobby Bowden, it's sort of a puking contest between buzzards. Neither one of them's gonna get out until the other one does. They probably phone each other. I think I'm getting out, Bobby. Okay, Joe, sure you are, you know. But uh, that's a dangerous time because a lot of people get fired because they're good. And we just can't, you know, they'll say, well, your program is like the tail wagging the dog. And then in your diplomacy, you will say, if the, talk, if the dog would get off his butt, the tail wouldn't wag so hard. You know, you're the front porch of the university. But, you know, you, you you know, you know what I mean? It's almost like people just want to tear you down. They'll look for little things your kids, your kids will do one little thing, it's not so bad. Everybody else is part, pure nine brawl, but yours is the big deal, you know, your, your kid. And then the fifth stage is where you're spent. There's just no fire inside anymore. And that's where you lose that energy to confront and to drive to higher levels and stuff like that. You know, you don't want to do some of the little crap like the recruiting or, you know, open the gym on Saturday for little kids or summer camp or you just lose that edge. And then it's time, it is, might be time to get out. You know what I mean? Now, the guys that got all this money, are they coaching, like, let's say Kraszewski, and I, I, I like him, I think he's a good guy. He's human, he's, he's not perfect. Is he coaching for the money? He's probably got money. He could have gone to the Celtics if he wanted money. Is he coaching because of the lifestyle? I think he's coaching because he likes building a team and teaching kids, I really do. It's exciting for him. I was with him one time where he's going to use this whole new thing. They're going to have two people outside and three people inside. And we're going to use our three best players inside. And I mean, people have done this for years, Mike, but he was trying to sell it to his coaches and his players. He likes building a team. And that's hard to do with all the bull crap in Division I. It's hard to get away from all the crap. There's people wanting him to speak in Rapid City, South Dakota, so they want me to write him a note. And I said, let me tell you something. It'll take at least $80,000 to get him. That's not, fine, we can pay that. Do we just send it to the basketball office? I said, if you send it to the basketball office, he'll never see it. You go through the Washington Speakers Bureau. They handle all his talks. And they will want $100,000. You know, well, that's his way of saying no to ask for $100,000. Now, last couple things. There's a, the guy that owns both the McDonald's in our town is one of the greatest guys in the world. His dad's an 89-year-old full-time preacher at the First Baptist Church. Buried his wife day after Christmas, was in the office the next day. He lives in that office because I think he needs to. He loved his wife. He said, I pity that poor woman. She had to listen to every sermon 
I ever gave, and I've given a lot of bad ones. I said, why don't you use some of these old sermons? He said, they're the worst. I can't do that to people. Two things, he, he's little poems he has. Beware of those who stand aloof, who greet each day with some reproof. The world would end if it were run by people who say it can't be done. You know, and think about that. Because you got to see the end before you begin. A lot of people will tell you it can't be done. And they're right. That if they're running it, it won't get done. Then he had this one. I have wept in the night at my shortness of sight to someone whose need I was blind. But I haven't as yet had a twinge of regret for being a little too kind. It takes strength to be kind. The weak can be cruel. The stronger the person, the kinder the person. The weaker the person, the crueler the person. Love is the coach's most powerful tool. If those kids know you love them, they will do anything in the world to, to serve you, to please you, to make you feel good. We've got a kid, Serbian kid. He needs a dad bad. I've got to be his dad. We've got several guys on our team that need a dad. He makes a mistake. He just, he's so smart, you know, he, he wants to be perfect. I said, Marco, tell you what, I love you. You're a great guy, and I've only known you for a couple weeks, but I tell you what, you got to get over trying to be perfect and to please everybody. You just got to play hard. God made you a certain way. Just be satisfied with it. As long as you play hard and be Marco, we'll be happy around here. If the kids know you love them, that, that's a really big thing. Faith, family, friends, fitness is your second job. Finances for your family, charity, and your retirement. And figure it out for yourself. Eventually kids have to figure it out for themselves. Faith, family, friends, fitness is your second job. Finances for your family, for charity, and for your savings and then figure it out for yourself. You are your own best expert. All this crap you heard from all these coaches, just look at it, glance at it, pull off stuff or highlight stuff you think fits you, and then throw the notes away or file them in a book under the coaches' names. But you gotta be you. You are your own best expert. You can figure it out. Dick Bennett. I gain more wisdom through my failures than through my successes. You'll figure it out. Is there anything known as a squirrel-proof bird feeder? There is no squirrel-proof bird feeder. Necessity is the mother of invention. You are a smart squirrel. You will figure out how to get to the bird seed. Trust yourself as a coach. You'll be fine. Now. You have to compete. My wife won the club championship in golf, and she's only been golfing about six years. She won it in the open, in the, in the masters, or the seniors, and the open. She won the net score, she won the growth score. She kicked butt. She's a competitor. We lose a game, I tell the coaches, you got it easy, boys. You're gonna go home to a flat screen. I'm gonna go home to the reaper. The Grim Reaper. She doesn't like losing. So our son Jerry was the two-time player of the year in the state of Tennessee, holds the record for assists in a college basketball career. He's six years old. She takes him into the doctors for a complete physical and psychological profile. They get done. Doctor comes out. She says, Doc, is he going to be a player? I said, well, ma'am, as best we can tell for this young six-year-old, He's going to be very deceptive. He has good changes of pace. He's not fast. He won't jump high. He can scan and see the floor. He has great ability to conceptualize. He is a genius 
IQ wise, did you know that? He said, well, I thought he would be. I've spent a lot of time with him with flashcards and stuff like that. She said, is there anything wrong with him, doc? He says, well, ma'am, there's one thing I'm very concerned about. I'm a little squeamish in talking with you about this, but I'll just say what it is. His private parts are very underdeveloped. He said, well, doc, what do we do? He said, well, he's got to eat toast every day for the rest of his life. The next morning, Jerry comes down for breakfast, there's a stack of toast two feet high on his plate. He looks at his mom and says, Mom, what's with the toast? I got to go to the gym. He says, shut up, Jerry, and eat your toast. You're going to eat toast every day for the rest of your life. You're not going to ask why. So he reaches up and starts grabbing toast. He says, hey, 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 just two slices. The rest is for your dad. <laughs> yeah. Okay, last thing. Wooden talks about love and balance. There's a lady I saw her do this at a Hall of Fame thing at the college I was at. And she taught math to dyslexic kids. And you know, there's four kinds of dyslexia. The common, most common being you get the letters backwards. And a coaching friend in Michigan named Bob Taylor, he's dyslexic. He just goes by Bob. <laughs> And he married a girl named Nan, and they had a daughter named Lil, and Nan is now pregnant with their son to be named Otto. <clears throat> I need to get an overhead projector for some of you guys to see this. <laughs> so she wanted to teach these dyslexic kids math. What, what job could you hold if you were dyslexic and work with numbers? Congressman. Okay, so she's going to balance all these nails on this nail. I see some of you people from Wisconsin are having a little trouble with this. If you were an insomniac and an agnostic, that means, you know, you have to look it up, agnostic, and just like go home at night and toss and turn wondering if there was really a dog. Well, let's get to the meat of the joke, I guess. We went <laughs> cutting around it. So she, she laid out a nail and started to lay nails across it like she's making a log cabin or something. And the whole idea here is to stress the point of balance. Because coaches sometimes are workaholics, relationshipholics, drinking or alcoholics, can't handle the stress, so they want to change their perception of reality. But you got to have balance. You know, you can be a little too religious too sometimes. You know, you can be, you know, moderation is sort of a big thing. So she got a row of five and a row of four. This is the balance nail right here, this middle nail in the row of five. So she lays another nail across and then the trick is to squeeze them tight. And these are nails aren't perfect, but I'll try. Then I got to get this nail on the middle there, and it'll balance every time. So you need, to, you need to think about it sometimes when it's just too much crap going on. What do I got to do to get back to balance? Now, when I had to learn how to use this leg, they put me on a, a board that cost like $30,000, and I'd stand on there and I'd have to balance and I'd have to move little arrows into boxes and hold them in the boxes to get this balance, to learn balance all over again. But I'll tell you, that's, balance is an important thing. Balance in your stance, balance in your offensive attack if you can. But balance in your life's a big deal. Balanced diet, tires are balanced, tires out of balance. You know, just think of all the things that balance and comp compass. But, you know, that's the tough thing about coaching, see, because you have to work so hard and be so obsessed that you almost lose balance. And you've got to come back to it in that third place. There's a guy named Truett Cathy, he started a thing called Chick-fil-A. 
There's a chapter on courtesy in his book, How'd You Do It, True It, that we read to our players. We just read highlighted stuff in it about being courteous. My pleasure when somebody says thank you, which means that I really have enjoyed serving you. So don't say thanks because it's been my pleasure. But he says on the back, the purpose of any business is to make a profit. Because without a profit, we can't provide for our employees, for our families, and for the betterment of our communities. The problem is, how do you balance making a profit with character? And I find that by applying Christian principles to my business. I see no conflict between Christian principles and good business practice. That's on the back of the flyleaf of his book, on the back cover. He thought it was so important. They don't serve on Sundays. They have a sign up that says, we don't serve on Sundays, we don't think anybody should, but we'll be here early on Monday morning to serve you, but why don't you go to the church of your choice today? So that's how he gets balanced. Now, maybe you're not disposed that way. You're going to have to find another way to get balance. Dean Smith used to sit in front of a fireplace and read philosophical books and religious books because he thought he was going to get fired because they're hanging him in effigy. So I bought a buck stove so I could sit in front of it and read like Dean Smith. You know what I mean? Figuring that's how you're going to do it. But everybody's got to be who you is because if you be what you ain't, you ain't what you is. You gotta be who you are. You gotta be your own best expert. And that's why after every clinic, you should go home and pull out what works for you and your program, and then forget the rest of it. Maybe come back to it a few years later, it might work, but it won't work right now. You guys be careful when you drive home and uh, make sure you get all that stuff or there's gonna be bad things happening to your dog. He was a peaceful man till they shot his dog, you know what I mean? And remember with an administrator, if you're going to shoot the suckers, gut shoot them so they die a slow and painful death, okay? <laughs> That's Charlie Spoonhour. I always like to end with that one. Thanks. <laughs> you are, I always fix you. Uh, Coach has been uh, uh, one of the best guys. Because our equipment budget was $1,200, took over 16 years ago. So we started the clinic so the kids could have shoes and uh, practice gear and all that. And I've always appreciated Coach Meyer of his commitment to the little guy. And uh, it's pretty interesting. Here's a, here's a man who, in a few weeks, will be making $25,000 to give a speech. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> and that certainly makes up for... I won't get through the house without my wife strip-searching me to get it, too. <laughs> but I... I uh, I, I just have a deep admiration for him, and this last year has been uh, a character-building year. And I was talking to my other good mentor in my life, uh, Paul Patterson, and Paul said to me, and we both agreed, we came to the same conclusion, that, uh, you know, we don't know why things happen on earth, but one thing we know for sure is Coach Myers, it's kind of like the prayer of D Davis, his his reach, his effect on people has more than quadrupled in this last year. And he has a difference, he has an opportunity to make a difference in people's lives for eternity. And I know he's faithful. So what I did here is I, through the help of his wife and uh, Northern State and a, a few other people, uh, we came up with some pictures. Now, if you notice this picture, it, it actually lights up. Those are his four grandkids. You can see this one has a death grip around his neck. 
and this one who looks a little bit disinterested is being held tight and this guy he's on his own world i think he's i'll tell you a good story on him he's around he's got some mental problems and uh came out i had my leg was being bandaged, was bleeding and stuff back in Aberdeen. and he comes in and he starts saying i got boo boos here i got boo boos here yeah, i had to see all his injuries they were worse than mine <laughs> so about a month later and we call my leg little buddy and a month later my wife hears band-aids being ripped open upstairs and Eli, his name, says, Eli, what are you doing? No, no noise. Eli, what's up? So he comes down, he's butt naked. He's got band-aids all around his penis. <laughs> and he says, I got a little buddy too. <laughs> <laughs> he's a sicko. <laughs> anyway, Coach, uh... <laughs> Way to light the mood. <laughs> On the bottom portion of this, we put together, uh, I, I helped Coach Meyer out, because on his, he's asked you to go to web, his website a couple times, coachmeyer.com. I told him, well, Coach, if you, if you put the cursor right by your nose and click, you'll get like a video slideshow. And he wasn't aware of that at that point. Yeah. You've s since seen it. Um, we walked him through it. It was buffering. That was the last I heard about that. Yeah. Um, and then what we did is I, um, we got some great pictures of him and Wooden, and we put him and Wooden on there, and uh, his family, and uh, then his SP speech is the end of the, the presentation here. So we want to present this to you, and Thanks. thank you for everything you've given to us. Thanks. I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. You're the best. You take one more picture, I'm going to slap your face. You know? I won't go together with you Okay, I'll do that. We'll do a portrait. Okay, there we go. I, I appreciate you all coming to this clinic. Yeah. My email is keith.freeman at valpo.edu. Uh, what, what we try to do is make this clinic better each year. Uh, I have a tough couple of the participants for next year, but I'm still looking for one more person. I would encourage you to email me if there's somebody that you would like to hear at this clinic. Um, email me, and uh, it might jar my memory, or we may be able to make a connection. Uh, I think we have a great opportunity to have Jim Foster here next year. I've talked to him about that. And Jim is one of the great basketball minds at Ohio State. Um, so I know he's he's on board to do this next year. So um, email me with your thoughts, ways we can improve the clinic. I want to especially thank Indiana Wesleyan, my second favorite team, um, <laughs> and their coach Steve Brooks for their giving up their weekend to be here. And uh, as well as uh, our team, I appreciate them sticking around. We have a recruit tomorrow, so they have a busy weekend. And it's a, lot, a big commitment for them to give up their week, but I wanted them to hear some of the wisdom that was said at the coming. Um, have a safe trip home, and, and thanks again for your support. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah.